Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today we are on location in beautiful Brattleboro, Vermont, at the Assisi Institute Conference, and we're here celebrating the 20th year of its existence, both here in the United States and with the founder and director of and the author of a couple of books, the last one being The Threshold Experiences, The Archetype of Beginnings, Michael Conforti. And this is hardly a beginning, what we're doing here today. It's really a continuation of a work that Dr. Conforti has engaged in going back some actually 30 years in developing his own way of understanding from a Jungian point of view and then expanding outward of a multidisciplinary way of looking at archetypal patterns, which will be the subject of today's show and is really the theme of the work of the Assisi Institute and the work of his life. And he's expanded this into incorporating new sciences, arts, humanities, and he has gone so far in creating a comprehensive perspective on understanding psychology and this essence of archetypal patterns that he has given a gift to so many people worldwide who have come to study here with him, who have attended the conferences, and uh, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show, Michael. Thank you, Mitch. Keep on saying more about me. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know what? A compliment. You deserve it. <laughs> and I, I can say also, as someone who uh, you invited to the first of them all in August of 19... 89 in Assisi, I have watched, first of all, I was honored to be there myself and to participate with a high level people that you had invited, but I've also seen an incredible metamorphosis, Michael, over the years of the growth of the Institute as well as your own thinking, which has manifested in your two books and uh, it's a beautiful gift you well, give. Thank you, thank you. And you were there at the beginning. In 1989, there was intuition. That there was something about the confluence of matter and spirit we wanted to talk about. Right. And I couldn't articulate what it was. And I just knew something about the world of the spirit was important, the world of the, the material world was important, and there was some bridging that was missing. And we invited, you know, you came as one of the world leaders, and Irvin Laszlo, and some of the world was exciting people that were studying this stuff, and bridges were slowly but surely being made. Exactly. And exactly. Back then, actually, I gave a talk on psychology East and West because of a background that I have in Eastern thought, mm -hmm. Buddhist, Vedantic, Taoist. A lot of my psychological thinking was largely formed by that. And uh, yet there we were in Assisi, the home of St. Francis. And it was beautiful to kind of uh, stand in both of those worlds and have a place, a context where that would be appreciated. It's and, inclusive. Uh, I mean, we've had every profession, exactly. every religion, every profession imaginable as a part of this. Exactly. And this is what makes what you're doing outstanding and distinguished in the world that's really so heavily bent on specialization. So to see the holistic threads and themes, Michael, is I think one of the gifts that you've been bringing forth. So, grazie. Prego. Appreciate it. Let's dive right in because the material of the book and your work is so rich. And I'd like to kind of step back and really simplify things from the beginning and ask you, we use the word here archetypes all the time in archetypal patterns. Would you define that for our audience so we can uh, kind of start there step by step and progress? I think Jungians and Jung tried this for years. It comes from St. Augustine, the original term. And I think none of us really know what archetypes are. It seems to be about something that guides and structures life. Some information, some meaning-making structures. And it's easier if you identify, like the archetype of midlife, the archetype of parenting, the archetype of transition, which is what this book is about. It's saying that there are these preformed states, preformed emotional experiences that we seem to walk into at different points of life, almost like portals that you cross. Yes, yes, yes. And why I got the uh, thresholds and archetypes is I realized, when I first did the book, I thought it's all about crossing into something, an archetype that you're entering. Mm -hmm. And I realized the threshold is different. You have an archetypal field that you're in, say, before you're in the midlife, you're in your 30s and 40s, that's one whole archetypal world. 
things we do, the proclivities, the activities we engage in, they're pretty well universal that we do at the early parts of our life. You suddenly enter this new phase of life, midlife, something comes over you. And so you literally cross over a threshold from this state and you realize something is presenting these thoughts and emotions and experiences that they seem to come out of nowhere. But then you realize they're so similar to what people have dealt with since the beginning of time when they entered the second half of life. So what we see then is that there is a, a cross-cultural reality yeah. to this notion of archetypes and they're time stage related. And is it possible for one to be living, let's say, two or three multiple archetypes at the same time? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, we've always had astrologers come to our program. It's supposed to be tough. Yeah, well, you're good, you know. It, and astrologers would say, you know, when you talk about these archetypes that are constellated, it's much like the constellation of astrological configurations. Mm -hmm. And while there are many different possibilities aspects, yeah. or aspects, it seems that a person has a dominant, a dominant configuration. Right. You've always just, said that my mine was puer eternus, Michael. I wouldn't say publicly. <laughs> you have. <laughs> we, it's something we well, share. You, you've said a lot of things about me too. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, bad union humor, you know. But I, I think each person has a dominant archetypal field of theirs. Yes. And so even when you move through different stages, maybe you move through the earliest stages of your life, you move into career, you move into parenting, there's still a certain flavoring that influences how we do this. Yes, so in a sense you've got a, a, a dominant archetype that let's say someone is in a sense born into, and I would have to say, since a lot of my thinking is biological in nature and understanding the myth, actually, I so appreciated Dennis Slattery here this, nice. uh, this past week who brought forth the understanding of the relationship of biology to mythology, that there, it's really one and the same conversation, if you will, or narrative. So from that point of view, bringing and invoking the idea of biology here, it's almost like we're born into a certain morphogenetic type, would you say? I mean, according to Jung's ideas of typology, that would be interfacing with archetype in some interesting way. It's very, again, it's complicated because I, yes, I think we're born with certain dispositions, certain yeah. astrological dispositions, morphological, whatever. But then these other stages of life, that we, we carry this piece with us. Mm -hmm. We enter these other stages, we cross the threshold, and the information from this other world seems to begin to influence us so much, it seems to take over. So even though we may have this particular tendency to do things a certain, you mentioned puer or whatever, you enter midlife, I think that becomes more dominant in your life at that point. And it seems to override. So there may be a, a uh -huh. tendency to, in, to drive this way, but you're still driving in this particular domain yes. that has preformed figures to it. Look, you think about midlife, it means half your life is over, half your life is to be lived yet. Every culture, every myth is known about this. There are songs written about this fairy tales written about Surely. it that teach us. So again, while we enter it in our own way, with our own kind of vehicle, so to speak, we're entering a domain that begins to, to work its stuff, its magic, its influence on us. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's like, you know, to be kind of practical about it, let's say we have a Volkswagen and we're going up a mountain and the mountain is the, is the chronology of our lives. Mm -hmm. and that Volkswagen is going to have the strength of a Volkswagen, not a Mercedes. That's right. And so at all the different points of elevation, if you will, it's going to have to be kind of hearkening back to its own inner it's a great strength image. and constitution. It's a great image, exactly. It's interesting. Yeah. Now, Michael, what is the bottom line here? What is the reason behind a person wanting to understand the archetypal patterns in their lives? How is it going to actually benefit them? You know, a lot of times we go through life with the proverbial bag over our heads. You know, we're influenced by things, that, you know, we we're shaped by things, but we really know what it is. And we find ourselves moving to the right or moving to the left or going towards this kind of relationship, that kind of relationship. And so much of what creates trouble in our lives, both individually, on a communal level, and globally, is the fact that we don't take the time to 
to show reverence for these shapers, number one. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that we don't take the time to try to understand what's, what's the message in this for us, and we just act it out. It's like being almost a fundamentalist, that we just go along with what's said and, and never question. And in this regard, you could be, one could become a midwife to the process of archetypal development and the, the striving towards a better life if we can read some of the signposts and interact mm. with it in a very proactive way. Mm. That to Beautiful. me is a gift. And you know, we've been yeah. looking, you, we've been talking about some of the global issues. And you realize most of the global decisions that are made, people are just acting out without it really understanding the, the deeper implication, whether it's war or peace initiatives or exclusion or inclusion of other countries or other nationalities into your culture. These are profound issues. 9-11 sure. was a great example. Not to go political, but just as a way of understanding this archetypally. Sure. Because your question, you know, when... What would you say? Well, when the atrocities happened, I mean, our government was very quick to say, I remember the line from Bush that I was outraged about initially, was, we're going to whip those guys. And I thought, my God, could you imagine your kid being of age to go into service and you're going to be responding to this cowboy militaristic attitude of revenge retaliation? It's like John Wayne in the White House. It, it was John Wayne in the White House. It wasn't until Colin Powell was the first to ask the question, what have we done that made people so angry at us? Mm -hmm. I thought that's the beginning of a different attitude. Truly. It's what one of the great philosophers, Eric Neumann, called the new ethic. The old ethic is we just act out and we, we retaliate and revenge and instead of reflecting on what is the meaning of this. You know? Exactly. There's no exactly. innocence in this case. This is not a terrible young child being abused by someone. This is, there. we've been a player. It's interesting, since you brought this up, Michael, to look at we as a people who stand behind a government and therefore also a president, what is the meaning of it to, about us as a people, as an identity, as an archetype, and what were we generating in this situation? I, I, I don't have an answer no, to that. No, no, no. When, when, when Obama began running and he was elected, I could tell you from a factual point of view, I had more patience, had more dreams of Obama than I've seen dreams of presidents in the past eight years. This was so significant. Mm -hmm. Now, I could comment on it for a few reasons. Please. Psychologically, what does a president represent? The president is the ruler of a country. Translating that psychologically it means this is the ruling power of the conscious mind. So you take somebody, and you don't want to say too much politically, but the fact that our country had elected Bush says a lot about where we were psychologically as a nation. That we endorsed this position of the militaristic revenge. Mm -hmm. It was also the story of the father's son. I mean, Bush is a proverbial Truly. weak son of a, of a not so strong father. And I'll tell you, by the way, I made a prediction, and it, we, I went public with this many years ago. Mm -hmm. When he first ran the initial thing, I predicted if he ever got elected, he would draw us into war immediately to prove he was a potent male. Yes. Excellent. And it was interesting. Really so intelligent then, observation. Oh, oh thanks. It was, I was reading a pattern. It was yeah, doing exactly. Pattern. So where we are right now, I mean, when you look at all the emotion generated around Obama with the inauguration and all that, why were so many thousand people crying? Mm -hmm. It was hope. That's right. And again, you see, I tried that to... That had been suppressed for so long. Yeah, totally. And so it like, came out with even greater fervor. Oh, people were starving. It was like yeah. starving in a desert for exactly. how long? Exactly. For somebody that can address issues in a meaningful way. But again, you're asking a bigger question, Mitch, which is yeah. what does it mean? It means that we're at a point collectively that this we've allowed something brand new to enter our system. Something that has more intelligence and more wisdom and more thoughtfulness. Also the fact that, you know, that he's a minority. That's huge that we're allowing the minority position to become to come exactly. part of the ruling class for us. The symbolic is powerful here as a combination of black and white exactly. coming together, the confluence, if you will, yeah. of a few different things, yeah. you know. But you made a very telling point just now, Michael, having to do with the recognition of an archetypal pattern, which goes back to the first question I was really asking. What's the point of studying archetypes and patterns? But you just gave a very good answer, which is that by recognizing these kinds of patterns and having a mind that sees in this perspective, you were able to predict the kind of behavior 
that would that would follow from, let's say in this case, uh, G. W. Bush being elected president. So that has powerful implications for us generally, both locally for a patient in the analysis room, as well as on other macro levels of our of our existence, including globally. You know, unfortunately, prediction has become sort of what one of the bad P words, like other uh, terrible things we don't want to ever say. But when you get into a pattern, what you're really having is, is a, there's a certain code. Patterns are constrained by the information they seek to express. Mm -hmm. That's one way of saying it. Mm -hmm. In that regard, when you have an outcropping of, of certain pieces of a pattern, you could have maybe three notes of a scale and say, well, most likely we're dealing with a major or minor here. Mm -hmm. And it's likely it's going to go in this direction. You can say, in the future of this pattern, it's probably going to go here. You can be proactive. And it's not rocket science. This is what a lot... Back, Alvin Toffler wrote, I think, in the 70s or 60s, um, Future remember. Shock. Right. He was a panel reader. And what's interesting is I've now done this in the movie industry. I've done it in organizations where you go in and you see where the system is at right now. Or you mentioned therapy, which is my, one of my greatest loves. You know, I've been an analyst now, sure. therapist, 30 years. That you see somebody's behavior... And you say, if you're here today doing whatever, you were probably were here yesterday, and probably a couple of days before yesterday, and it's likely it's probably going to go to tomorrow in the future. Because there's a contiguous line, and a lot of what I've been studying is not just the idea of patterns, but what is it that holds behavior into these seemingly fixed orbits right. that have trouble changing? Yes. And uh, this is the first book is all about that. This right. book is more about the change process. Yes, exactly. Here you use the um, initial meeting of a therapist and a client mm -hmm. in a sense as a metaphor for all that can follow exactly. and as the container in which a tremendous amount of information flows, which in a sense presets yeah. what is to follow. Exactly. Anything more you want to say? Yeah, about because that? yeah, what happens in the initial conditions is whatever the, the behavior of a system or individual is, say in the first session psychotherapy, what got me was, and this is going back 25 years, working with a wonderful mentor named uh, Dr. Robert Lang, a brilliant man who you know. Who you introduced me yep. to many years ago. He would look at the initial conditions, and what we began to see was that whatever issue the patient had in their life somehow became enacted with the therapist. I didn't want it to see, see, to me, I thought that was just almost uncanny that no matter what I brought to it, I would found, the system would find a way to reinvent uh -huh. itself, to kind of re reenact. reenact itself, exactly, mm -hmm. by me becoming a, a player in this re repetition of something. And then I went to study, say, what is it about these repetitions? And I realized, well, God, what's going on is in the first meetings, the threshold experience, the whole history yes. is suddenly present. We don't have to go back to the, the past and do archaeology for this. It's right there. It's right in front of you. If you could begin to look at the interaction as being the model. So it's like exactly. coming from in here, but not only from the patient, it's also drawing on the therapist. And the therapist inadvertently becomes part and parcel right. of this reenactment. Part of the system. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, basically what we see is in a lot of the new sciences these days, one of the words that has shown up largely is this notion of fractality. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a fractal relationship of the original scene, if you will, of the therapist and the client being enacted as time goes on in a cyclical way exactly. over time, depending on the level of consciousness that is um, catalyzed and constellated through their interactions, first initially and then therefrom. And it, it reminds me of uh, going back to kind of a biology metaphor of inception, the beginning, the zygote. Inside that is the whole story. So in a sense, that original meeting of the therapist, if you will, it may sound funny, is in a way um, a recapitulation in some way of our biological nature right. in a psychological way being fleshed out. Two Do you know? Yeah, I know exactly. When I wrote the new introduction to this book, I really struggled. I did like three versions of the introduction. First one uh, didn't work, the second one didn't work, and the third one, I did like 30, 40 pages. It just flowed. Mm. And I realized you know, uh -huh. that in doing the study of initial conditions, I was able to look into the inception of life itself. 
because you're right. Yeah. What happened in the initial interview is the same kind of things that happen in the beginning of life itself. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think this is just going to be a very simple, relatively simple, straightforward study of what happened with the patient therapist. Yes. But when you get into biology and systems, you realize, my God, this is the inception of life itself in front of you. Exactly. I mean, it's so interesting. So it's, everything is an unfolding from that. We just keep yeah. seeing our life as a a form of repetitive pattern, but you also raise a very important question that comes up for all therapists and for all people, and that is, what are the elements and the component parts of change? You know, what are they? What is it that will take um, a pattern that has been in place, a personality pattern, an obsession, compulsion, what have you? It doesn't have to be pathologically set. And there's a certain, you could say, a neurocircuitry that accompanies it. And what is it that can help happen in a dynamic between, in this case, you as analyst and a client that's going to shift that so that the patient ultimately is going to be, what do we want the outcome to be? Mm -hmm. Happiness? Joy, it's not bad. Balance, <laughs> love, <laughs> you know, prosperity. What? No. What? What are those elements, Michael? Well, How would you like, address that? Well, I know one, it's a broad, but and a difficult question, but you're qualified for answering it. Well, number one, I think what happens in therapy most times is that we seek to just change the behavior. We change the pattern. See, that's not good. It's not generative. Like mechanically, mechanically, you're drinking, you're drugging, you're whatever it might be, and we find different ways to stop it. Yes. And on one hand, that's wonderful because you know th these things do destroy individuals and families. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where it's behavior modification that can be done, and it works. There are ways to do it. Yeah. However, it doesn't get to the core issue. Like you know, Jung was one of the first to even talk about the dynamics behind alcoholism, and he realized that you know, alcohol and the spirits have been part of communal life since the beginning of time. We've mm -hmm. always had some spirit in a bottle. We've had some alcohol. Truly. We've had some drug. And he believed that even underneath addiction is a certain spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. Now, simply put, sure. any any addiction is an addiction to something. That's silly, that way to put it. But what it means is we need to understand that what is it that through this substance you're really addicted to. So we can remove the substance. But guess what? The drama is still alive. Placement, exactly. Huh. All the energy that drove the person toward that one in the first place still gonna be will still be in place perhaps toward another. And so is, that's why getting to the core. And this is why a lot, of therapy, a lot of therapies don't really make lasting It could change the behavior. It's a proverbial finger in the dike story, you know, where you, you totally. and again, it's good enough if that's, if you're gonna be flooded, that town's gonna be flooded, but you only get 10 fingers. Use your finger. Yeah, but you only get 10 <laughs> fingers after a while. Exactly. No, that point is really well made, really well made. Interesting, from a point of view of total biology, something I've been speaking with you about, uh, alcoholism is thought of as a method of a child to bridge the gap between the mother and the fire. Because after all, what is alcohol but a mixture of two main elements, fire and water? That's interesting. So you've got the masculine and the feminine principles. And oftentimes what we find, of course, in alcoholic families, so to speak, is conflict on that parental level. So the child who may tend toward drinking would be one who is seeking to mediate and reconcile the masculine and the feminine principles as it's showing up in the house. It's kind of interesting. So it's bringing another perspective in a purview to uh, kind of awaken the... You look process. at symbolic expression, which, you know, whether biological exactly. systems or psychological systems, you're asking, what, what's the nature of the pattern? And I think with the new biology and these kind of uh, discoveries of making great insights, is you can't just keep filling people with pills, antibiotics, throwing in them just into AA or just into mental hospitals. There's got to be some, because look, are we, are we really, you know, James Hillman said, 100 years of therapy, we any better. Culture is still in rough shape. I mean, exactly. thank God, I mean, I, I yeah. feel like a lot of people, I feel more hopeful than I have in a long time about mm -hmm. the, the global situation too, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. There's something shifting, but there's going to be a paradigm shift on every level. I mean, it's interesting, 10 years ago, what, one out of every $10 went to alternative or complementary medicine, is today one out of four. Um, yeah, one dollar out of every four. It's a multi-billion dollar industry at this point. I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah.
because people are asking bigger questions. Exactly. That's what this is about. Exactly, it really is. And it's a very good point that you and Hillman are making. I mean, after all these years, you know, since, say, Freud, you know, how much help has actually uh, shown up in the world on the global level? Yeah. You know, what appreciable difference has it made? Well, I think it has made some. But I appreciate Hillman's perspective in that, what can we do to make it more sooner? Because at this point, we're at the level of ecological collapse, not just cultural. It's gone beyond that. We're really at a precipice. You know, I was invited to work with the ambassador from a Central American country about seven years ago. Mm -hmm. He heard my lectures in New York on uh, initial conditions and all. And he said, my country's been at war for 300 years. And they've had uh, boundary disputes, three country boundary disputes over water rights, fishing rights, and all that. And he said, I think your understanding of initial conditions and patterns can help us. Would you consider working on international peace efforts with us? I said, I've never done it before, but I, I'll consider. Beautiful. He arranged a meeting in Washington, D.C. Um, he was there. I brought a research team with me. I put together, and also with the highest international litigator in the world. This is the person that would go to these countries and make determination, cutting up the pie. Who we get this and this. And I talked for a while, and this litigator, and I was so impressed, he said, I never for a moment ever in my career thought there may be anything aside from just the material issues involved. He said, so he was already changed by the conversation. So. I'm changed by this conversation. Uh, me too. Thanks, Mitch. It's Absolutely. always a pleasure working with you. So great, Michael. Thank you for your great work. And I just pray that you continue it with the same uh, vivace and power that Thank you, you have until Thank now. You. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us, including all of you. Uh, please visit our website at www.abetterworld.net. Join our newsletter at the same new at the same website, and give us a call at 212-420-0800. We love hearing from you, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. <laughs>